Please join me in welcoming Robert Lepofsky. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So the talk is going to be about the most interesting techniques of two infamous APT groups that I think need no introduction. Um, over the 12 years that I'm working in ESET at malware, doing malware research, I had the privilege of working with some of the most skilled uh, reverse engineers and threat researchers. So uh, credit goes to them for some of the discoveries that I'll be talking about in the presentation. So before we get to the main scope of the attack, uh, as Katie said, uh, just a really quick introduction about uh, how we use it. So we started augmenting our threat reports, not only with IOCs, but uh, also attack mappings. For example, our We Live Security blog posts. Uh, this is what it looks like. And this is just a snippet for this particular example. So uh, the list is much longer, but you can get an idea. So there's the tactic, the technique, and also an inscription how that particular malware uh, uses, uh, uses that technique. Um, also, for similar reasons and uh, in a similar way, we are mapping uh, attack in our EDR solution, said Enterprise Inspector, whenever that was feasible and possible because there's a various varying level of granularity uh, for that. Okay, so those were the external uses. Uh, for improving the communication with our audiences, whether it's our readers or our users, um, leveraging the common taxonomy uh, aspect of attack, but we also use it internally as one of the guides for enhancing uh, Enterprise Inspector and improving our analytics. But I won't go into the details about that because you've been hearing all, all, all about those things at this conference, or you might have read the attack's great uh, blog posts on these subjects, so they cover that really well. Okay, so let's get to those APTs and those interesting uh, techniques. Of course, this is not going to be a comprehensive uh, listing at all. That would make for a much, much longer presentation. Uh, just some highlights which I thought was, were really interesting and noteworthy. Uh, so the first group, and because of the lack of time, I just selected one particular software that they were using. Uh, that was APT28, or Fancy Bear, or Sednit. And Last year, we found out that they used the first UFI rootkit found in the wild. So this was a pretty significant deal. Um, running code uh, from the SPI flash memory, the first thing that's, that runs when you start up your computer uh, before Windows is loaded, before any security software has a chance to load too, uh, that's a really powerful persistence mechanism uh, and gives the attackers an ability to withstand not only uh, complete wipe of the system, but even a hard drive replacement. So they use this uh, against attack attacks against uh, in, in attacks against diplomatic targets in Europe. Um, you can read all of the details in the paper. I'm not going to uh, go into them. I'll just mention that they drew their inspiration from Low Jack, which was a legitimate piece of uh, anti -theft, a legitimate anti theft solution uh, for laptops, and. In an anti-theft solution, this powerful persistence mechanism makes sense. I mean, if a thief was able to easily get rid of uh, the solution, it wouldn't be a very good anti-theft tool, would it? Okay, so it's featured in attack and listed under the system firmware uh, technique. Uh, there are some other examples over there, uh, but basically before uh, low jacks, UFI rootkits were mostly in the realm of theoretical proof of concepts or reported, according to leaks, reported functionality of uh, government agencies or the hacking team software. Okay, let's move on to the second group where we'll spend a little bit more time uh, looking at their techniques. And they're known at, under the umbrella term as sandworm. Uh, in our naming, we go into a little bit lower level of uh, granularity, uh, which uh, stems from the way we were tracking them. So the first, uh, threat cluster and activities related to that was black energy. I think needs no introduction here, uh, which facilitated their most infamous uh, campaign was that it facilitated um, the first ever power grid attacks, blackouts caused by a cyber attack. Uh, then there was Indestroyer, also referred to some folks as crash override. Uh, this was 
I would say, one of the most cunning pieces of malware we ever revealed. And the reason is that not just it's modular, but uh, it's able to communicate with industrial control systems uh, hardware uh, using their very own language. Uh, it had an implementation of four different uh, ICE, uh, industrial protocols. So effectively, this malware was bridging the gap between IT and OT attacks. Um, we also saw a shift from black energy uh, to what we call telebots at some time. So there were a lot of things in common, like shared infrastructure, but the malware was different. The reason why we called it that was because they were using the Telegram API for command and control communication. Um, and not only the tools uh, change, but also the focus. Uh, so it's really hard to conclusively say that they are exactly the same people, the same group behind it. Um, and the focus shifted from critical infrastructure and the energy sector towards the financial sector. And their most famous uh, attack, which spread beyond the borders of Ukraine worldwide, was, of course, not Petya. And in parallel to the Telebots activity, uh, there was also Gray Energy, which we consider the successor of Black Energy, staying with that original focus of critical infrastructure and energy companies, and still active until today. So that was just a quick overview of, uh, of that group, and let's take a look at the techniques that they were using. So for initial access, uh, they were mostly using spear phishing, that's unsurprising, uh, with various methods of uh, gaining execution, whether it was pure social engineering, or they were also using exploits, even zero days. But let's get to the more interesting and uh, not that common stuff. Uh, so they did supply chain compromises. Um, the NotPetya, uh, starting off from the infection of Medoc, so from a Medoc backdoor, as we call it, that's the most widely known example, but there were also other cases. Another interesting uh, technique was used by Gray Energy, and that was exploiting a public-facing application. Specifically, uh, it was trying to gain entry inside the network via a, a vulnerable web server. And a couple of other interesting, notable techniques uh, by this group. Uh, there were Black Energy plugins that were abusing TeamViewer, so targeting specific versions of TeamViewer, change, changing the settings uh, to enable a backdoor and remote uh, unattended access to that infected machine. Even So basically, the ability to gain, uh, regain entry even after all their other tools were detected and cleaned off the system. Uh, another Black Energy plugin, which acted as a parasitic infector. Uh, this was really interesting because uh, we don't see a lot of these virus-like uh, malware uh, a lot nowadays. So we saw some Juniper installers uh, circulating in the wild that were infected uh, by this plugin. And the third example I want to mention, I guess uh, the ICX people in the room will recognize this. Um, that was execution via HMI. So in this particular example, it was targeting uh, Simatic, the Simatic, uh, uh, sorry, Simplicity HMI. But there were also, also others uh, that were targeted, such as WinCC. Uh, so that script that you saw over there, uh, that would be launched by Simplicity in this case, and it would run uh, the, the first stage of black energy. So uh, the details about this are described in this ICS advisory, so you can go there and check, check out the details if you want. Um, this is interesting because this was one of the first, uh, first indicators that this group had an interest in critical infrastructure uh, and ICS. This was, of course, before uh, the blackouts actually happened. Speaking of, uh, let's talk about impact. Because if I were to describe this group with just one word, I would call them impactful for the havoc they caused uh, in Ukraine. Uh, with whether it was with the blackout, uh, which left hundreds of thousands of people without electricity, or with the pseudo ransomware, not Petya, uh, going beyond the borders and affecting some of the world's largest corporations. Um, let's take a look at the Indestroyer impact. So the primary one, of course, was the ability to de-energize uh, that substation. Um, and it was doing uh, that, as I already mentioned, by sending commands to these types of devices, protection relays, effectively opening circuit breakers and speaking the language 
of these devices. So that's an important thing to say. So there were no, uh, there were no exploits. There, there were no software vulnerabilities involved in this. Uh, vulnerabilities, however, were involved in the second type uh, of functionality that affected the operations at that workstation, and that was carried out by the denial of service uh, component. Uh, this also went after the protection relays, and it was abusing a fault that was abusing a vulnerability, not a zero day because it was patched already at the time, but not in those particular cases, and it would render the protection relays unresponsive. And the third impact, although if we were to consider uh, the ICS, uh, upcoming ICS attack, it would probably be classified a little bit differently in a different uh, level of granularity. But basically, the third way that uh, industry affected the operation uh, of an electrical substation was by, through the data wiper component. So that one did not go after the protection relays, but after the HMIs used to control and monitor them. Um, and the purpose of that was to amplify the impact, uh, to make recovery uh, from the attack more difficult. So wipers, these destru destructive components, are kind of a signature thing uh, of this group. Uh, we observed an evolution of this uh, through the years that we were tracking them from the black energy plugins, uh, through standalone kill disk components, to uh, file encryptors, disruptive file encryptors masquerading as ransomware, most notably NotPetya, but there were also others uh, before that that, were, that had the uh, same basic idea. And they even, in some cases, in some variants, they even threw uh, a little bit of a prank intended to intimidate uh, the victim. So any Mr. Robot fans here will probably recognize this. Okay, so to finish off the talk, uh, it's great that attack uh, is evolving. Um, when we first started uh, using it and contributing, the one impact, that uh, the one tactic that was directly missing was impact. So we're really happy uh, that that was added. Uh, if I were to predict uh, future expansion, I would say uh, that we can probably expect even more criminal types of impacts uh, being added as we're already seeing uh, the boundaries between uh, threat types and motivations already becoming very blurred. So with that, I thank you for, for listening. Uh, use attack and contribute. Thank you.